everyone. We're here in the southern portion of Big Bend National Park. Uh, we just drove 20 miles on a dirt road in a GMC Sierra and we probably shouldn't have made it, but here we are at the Mary Skull Mine. Uh, this is probably one of, the, one of the best preserved mines in North America and it's because it takes 20 miles to get here and not many people take the trek out here. But anyways, this is a Mary Skull Mine. It is a mercury mine from 1917-ish through the 1940s. Um, as we go up, I'm going to talk about the history of the place. All right. Before I talk about the geology of the area, I'm going to give a little rundown about the history. So before World War I, there were a few smallish operations here on the Morisco Mine. Basically they saw cinnabar, the mercury ore, on the surface and you know they used hand tools to dig it up and loaded it onto burrows and pretty much shipped them out to processing plants. But it wasn't until when Woodrow Wilson declared war on Germany in 1917 that Everyone wanted mercury, or quicksilver as they called it at the time. So everyone wanted it because it was used as a primer to detonate gunpowder during World War I. And um, because everyone wanted it, the price went up. And when the price goes up, everyone's like, where's the mercury? Let's start mining the mercury. So the Chisos mine in Terlingua, which is right outside Big Ben, became the largest producer of mercury in the region. Um, as many as 2,000 people lived in the town during the 1910s and 1920s. And there's a really cool cemetery there. They no longer mine there, but I hear they're really famous for their chili cook-offs. Anyways, so the guys in Terlingua started raking in huge profits and people around the area were like, well, if they're making so much money, we should try to find other areas that have mercury too. So one of those people was a business guy named W.K. Ellis, and he's apparently not the Ellis that we saw in the Terlingua cemetery. And he bought all the mineral rights for this area and he started mining. Um, just like his competitors in Terlingua, Ellis also relied almost exclusively upon poorly paid, skilled and unskilled Mexican workers to keep his mercury mine functioning. Um, sorry, there's a flyer on here. But, uh, so the skilled workers earned $1.25 per day, 10 hours a day, 6 days a week, and unskilled workers earned 90 cents a day. So the main shaft that he mined was around 50 to 60 feet deep. And I would say that he had a pretty successful operation here. And um, I feel like he had insight that the price was going to drop for mercury after World War I because he sold right before it dropped. And um, he sold it to Bill Burcham, Billy Burcham. And Billy Burcham had hopes of hitting the Buda limestone here at Marisco Mountain and in Terlingua they knew that the Buda limestone had a bunch of cinnabar so Billy was hoping to hit it big and um, he ended up buying a bunch of new equipment building more houses for the workers in anticipation that he was going to find a lot of mercury here uh, so this is probably a good time to talk about the geology um, as to why cinnabar occurs here in the, in Big Bend National Park. So during the Laramide orogeny, um, and the Laramide orogeny is what geologists call the event that created the Rocky Mountains. So during that, rock layers here, which were originally flat, were folded into an anticline, which is kind of like an arch shape, and it formed the mountain called Mariscal Mountain. And you can see how the rock layers here are angled like an arch. Often whenever you're folding these rocks, you form faults or cracks in the rock, and these cracks were later filled with magma, and sometimes, as in this case, the magma squeezed themselves in between rock layers. At some point, probably the tectonic event that caused the Basin Range province created more cracks, which allowed mercury sulfide gas to rise up from deep-seated magma. And geologists think that the magma that squeezed itself into cracks served as a seal that basically trapped all the gas or fluids. And since cinnabar precipitates at low pressures, this was a pretty comfy place to settle down, maybe start a family. And over time, erosion peeled away the top layers, exposing the cinnabar 
for Mr. Martin Solis to find in 1900. But I'm pretty sure that Native Americans found out about this first, considering they probably used the cinnabar to create their pictographs down by hot springs. And usually they crush up cinnabar into a powder and then they add animal fat and water or water and they use that as a paint. Okay, so back to the Marisco mine. After World War I, the price of mercury dropped and I mentioned that Ellis probably knew that this was coming somehow. Smart man, I guess. And he, f and Bill, who was the owner at the time, was forced to borrow money in hopes that the price would rebound. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't do it in time and the mine had to cease production in 1923. The price eventually did go up, however, during the Second World War because if I learned anything in my high school economics class, it's that when demand goes up, price goes up. And everyone wanted mercury for World War II because they had explosives and ammunition that all needed mercury to detonate. So in 1942, Bill reopened the operation and he extended the main shaft down to a depth of 438 feet, hoping to hit the Buda limestone and make a huge profit. Bill made a ton of other additions, like I said, more rooms for workers and a new furnace that was more efficient, but ultimately the mine had to stop operating because he just didn't produce enough to pay off his debts. So unfortunately, this mining engineer from Stanford stood no chance to this geology of the area, which was a lot different from what he knew of in the Terlingua district. This is an anticline, and the, sulf the mercury sulfide gas rises up and gets stuck under the igneous layers on top and interlingua the mercury sulfide gas probably gets stuck under a clay layer so he was hoping to dig down deep but honestly i i don't know if anything was down there and all in all most of the mercury mines in texas uh stopped operating by 1946 uh since partly because there was less demand and also other countries flooded the market with their own mercury, uh, mostly Spain. And now if the U.S. needs any mercury for thermometers and whatnot, uh, they pretty much just import it from other countries. Right now I'm standing on top of the mine tailings pile and this is pretty much the leftover stuff after they extract the mercury from the ore and a lot of people were concerned about mercury being leached out into the environment. Um, there's a tributary nearby that feeds into the Rio Grande and so people were worried that when it rained it would pick up bits of mercury and then take it and deposit it in the river but they checked the hair, they took hair samples from black bears in the area and they didn't see any noticeable occurrence of mercury in their hair. So they think it's okay. And I think the reason why there isn't a huge issue is because it doesn't really rain out here. So there's not a lot of precipitation that picks up the mercury just because it doesn't really happen, so. Mm -hmm. 